for my mother.
היא יודעת, היא יודעת, עד שאני אסיים. אוקיי, תן לי את הטלפון. אוקיי. 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 אוקיי.
welcome to uh, Profiles in Heroism with Sivan Rahab Meir. Thank you all for joining us. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our sponsors for, uh, for tonight's evening. Uh, first of all, Dr. Alan T. Lippis for sponsoring the weekend. For their sponsorship, as well as another 20 or so uh, uh, other sponsors that are listed here on the screen. We thank each of you uh, for, your, for your sponsorship. Roughly, uh, almost exactly a year ago, our guest speaker tonight, Sivan, shared with the world a story, an interesting story, which I thought was fascinating, um, that she heard from an individual named Chaim Rabinovich, Chaim Rabinowitz, who recalls that when he was six years old, of course, uh, Tubishvat is coming up shortly, when he was six years old, he was living in communist Poland, and when Tubishvat came around, his family obviously was thinking about the land of Israel, they really wanted to make Aliyah, they weren't allowed to make Aliyah, during uh, this time period, the communists weren't allowing them to, uh, to leave. And when Tubishva came around, the rumor came to, through the town that a package, a box, a crate of oranges from the land of Israel somehow made their way to this forlorn town in Poland. And as Tubishva approached one night after work, his father took him when he was six years old to the market to buy one orange from the land of Israel. And they bought that orange and the excitement was palpable in the home. They put it at the center of the, of the dining room table. All the neighbors came to look just to gaze at the orange from the land of Israel. And this six-year-old boy, Chaim, felt like he was the most important kid in the entire town. He had the land of Israel orange. And then Tubishva rolled around. His father gathered the whole family around, took the orange, put it in the middle of the table. And as a six-year-old, he remembers the English of what happened next. His father took a knife made a blessing of Borek Ayat and Hashem Yanu and cut up the orange. And he burst out into tears, he burst into tears and cried over this orange from the land of Israel that was cut up by his father. And he remembers that after they ate the orange, he took the orange peels and saved them for months just to have a smell, of, a sniff, a whiff of the land of Israel um, in, their, in their home. And not too long afterwards, his family was able to get permits to make Aliyah, and uh, they actually, um, uh, and, and Chaim wanted to take with him these orange peels from that Tubishvat, uh, from the Tubishvat day, and his mother said, don't worry, where you're going to the land of Israel, there's no problem, you're going to have plenty of oranges, and you don't need to bring those peels with you. Uh, the point is that uh, there were periods in time when access to anything related to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, was very, very limited. Thankfully, we live in a time where fruit land from the land of Israel, as well as uh, much else, access to Israel is, is relatively easy, but it is rare to find individuals who embody the spirit of Jerusalem as it is, uh, as it is described by David Amelach, by uh, King David in Tehillim, as a city of Ir Shechubra Le'eftav, a city that makes all Jews come together in brotherhood and unity and with a common purpose. And one of those very, very few people who embody the spirit of Jerusalem, and every generation there are only a handful of Jerusalemites who really uh, embody that spirit. One of those very few people is our speaker tonight, Sivan Rahab Meir, has succeeded in doing this and embodying the spirit of Jerusalem, bringing people together. And it is a great honor to introduce Sivan to the <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Tandler, for exaggerating. Thank you very much. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I can tell you, I'll give you a list of other great Jews that are really doing it, but thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for being here. Shavuot Tov, Shavuot Tov Atlanta, Shavuot Tov with Jacob. Uh, it's a pleasure you, you came here again. I hope the leap is not, you're here again. I think it's the, the fifth or the sixth time you hear me. I'm not This coming. weekend. I'm not going. Okay, I hope I thank <laughs> the leap is, uh, uh, they, they, uh, um, they were with me everywhere this weekend except for Tamima. If you didn't come to Tamima school, except for that, you're listening for me so many times. I thank you uh, for coming here again, those who were here uh, this morning, and uh, the new faces, the new people I see. Uh, it was really a tremendous job this year. As a journalist, I feel, really, I spoke with dozens of people at this show, me and my husband, Yedidia, who are here together. I feel that each and every person here is a story, really, is an item. Like, so many, like, Bali Chukla, and people that became, like, more this and more that, and couples with, like, the coolest stories, and I, really, you're, you're something, really. I really feel it's a unique place, this, this congregation, and I thank you for the, for the schutz to be here. Um, 
I visited, like I was here, I visited really, I think, the educational uh, institutions in Atlanta. I was here seeing you. Uh, I was in AJA High School. We went to the AJ, AJA High School on Friday, and we visited Tamima, also a very educational, important institution. And we were in a fourth um, important educational institution, uh, the CNN. Okay, we went on Friday, we took the tour through the CNN, yeah. Education, whether we like it or not, it influences people, right? It educates them, right? whether we, we uh, like uh, what they do or we dislike what they do. And uh, I was there with a, a friend of mine, a new friend of mine, I met her uh, here. Her name is Lisa Cohen. She's like a producer there. Uh, and she took us, we, we did the official tour, and then she took us to like a private tour behind the scenes. And um, when I was when I entered the big building, by the way, did you do this tour? Because sometimes when you live in a city with all the attractions, you don't go there, right? Anyone did this tour in the CNN? Okay, so I'll tell you what's going on in CNN Atlanta Studios. Okay, and they take fifteen dollars just to show you, <laughs> show you around. But it's nice. Um, the first thing you see, and for me, it really helped me to understand the parasha that we read in here this morning. Really. Uh, I don't know if that's what they meant, but when you enter the, the big building, you see Ted Turner, and you enter, and you see their logo, and the logo says, facts first, right? <laughs> facts first. First of all, facts. But then there's another wall, there's like two walls. When you enter, you see that facts first with the logo CNN, and then there's another wall, and then there's the entrance where the group like uh, uh, waits there for the tour guide to take us to, to this tour. So the other wall says, there's a huge picture, uh, Walt Blitzer's there, the huge picture of Walt Blitzer. And uh, by the way, when he wrote in the Israeli media, you know what was his name? He signed all these pieces. Ze'ev, Ze'ev Blitzer, Walt, it's Ze'ev, Ze'ev Blitzer. And he wrote, uh, he, he, he's, it, it's his face there, and it, it's written, uh, so after we, you see facts first, you see, uh, it says, and he even copied it, it's the story that needs to be heard it's the story that needs to be told, CNN. So they tell us facts first, okay, but then what are you doing with these facts, okay? Facts will not make you do anything meaningful in your life, they're just facts, statistics, okay? Dry things, like that's not really something like that will make us do some, something in this world, okay? So facts first, but even they understand, CNN understands that you must make the facts into a story, a narrative, something that you can share and tell, and something that will affect other people's lives. And the, it, it, fact first, but then, it's the story that needs to be heard, it's the story that needs to be told, CNN. So this morning, when I was sitting here listening to the parasha, I heard the same message, okay, with of course a different story, but, that's what we read here this morning. What is the ma'at tesaper? What is tesaper in Hebrew? Sipur. What's a sipur? Story, exactly, yeah. Uh, again, you're proving yeah, your Hebrew's great. Uh, every word I check with you, you already know. So, the um, ma'at tesaper means tell your son a story, a good story, a meaningful story, a Jewish story, Yetziat Mitzrayim story, and they will remember it, and they will tell it to their grandchildren and grandchildren, etc., etc., until we will sit here this Shabbos in Atlanta in the year 2019 telling the same story. You take the facts. The facts are this and this it happened to the Egyptians, and this and this happened to the Jews, but let's make the facts into a meaningful story, and that's the best present I think a parent can give to his kids, first of all to himself, a story. Now, our um, our Me'arech, again I thank the Shloshes for the warm hospitality, the Achnasat Uchim. Do you all know the Shlosh family? That's something special, really, that's special. Now, while you're clapping, Mr. Shlosh is doing his way to uh, Ireland. You know, he, is a, he, do you know the secret here? The Coca-Cola secret? Okay. Because when he really likes the guests, he tells them the secret. Okay, what do they put there in this Coca Cola? I don't know if, if it, here it's like a, it's a legend. In Israel, it's like a legend, you know, because Coca Cola is the, the secret ingredients. So people always ask them that. So what is the Mashgiach doing? Okay, how can the Mashgiach uh, Kashrut no, uh, give the, the Kashrut certificate? Oh, you sign if he doesn't know what's in there. Okay, so. 
come visit Mr. Schloss, come for Shabbos, he'll tell you the secret. No, he didn't really tell all the secrets, but it's very interesting. Anyway, um, what I will tell you is not only the Coca-Cola story, but I uh, when I take it back home, he suddenly showed me this Shabbos in a new book, like a new series, uh, that, uh, now the, uh, the last volume is, is out, it was published, it was printed. It's called the Harab, uh, Chumash Harab, but the, 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 um, like, uh, um, thoughts of Rabbi Joseph Perslovechik, they edited by uh, each parasha, you can read these, uh, like, uh, his ideas over the parasha, and he showed me, Lema'at de Saper, Harab Perslovechik is telling us that the parent is the sofer, and the child is the sefer. Now, do you understand what I said? The parent is the writer, and the child is the book. It's not like there's a book and we're writing there. No, the child, in the heart of the child, that's the book. Le and the Saper. So, fact first, but we're making a meaningful story out of it, and thanks CNN for like uh, um, making me uh, understand it. And we're all storytellers, but journalists, I think, are the most meaningful storytellers. And I'm going to tell you uh, tonight uh, about my work. I want to share a few stories. I brought seven stories with me from Israel. Well, see, uh, six positive stories. One, remember the word Fadiha we just learned this morning? Fadiha? What is a Fadiha? A big Fadiha? You'll see. But um, I do want to share like a positive things that are happening in Israel. Because while we spoke, and I think re really you, most of you are even spoke personally, you have many questions, fascinating questions. You really know what's going on in Israel. I think more than more, is, more, more than most Israelis, I think, are really in the business into it. So why does Livni? Doesn't the fire Gabai before Gabai fired Livni? You're like, okay, listen. Um, anyway, what, um, what I will share, I think maybe you're not really aware, you know, uh, and you don't really know these things, that, because there's a famous sentence we say in the news, at the beginning of the show, okay, every evening, you know, the news starts, and we say good evening, okay, good evening. But then for an hour, we prove to you why it's wrong, okay? <laughs> good evening. Bad, 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 corruption, violent, demonstrations, Balagan, bad, and the, uh, like, uh, weather cast in the, in the beginning, it's also bad, and that's it. So, every night we, we like, concentrate, we, we focus on the bad things, so tonight, I really want to say good evening, and to prove to you it is a good one, to fill it with good content, good things that are happening, that are taking taking place. Sometimes you hear about uh, heroism, Israeli heroism, only when it comes to the battlefield, okay? And uh, Baruch Hashem, we need the heroism there, but that's not the only field, and that's, that's, as Jews, that's not the only type of heroism in the world, okay, that exists, we know it. I want to talk about other profiles, okay, other like attitudes, angles, uh, uh, toward heroism, and uh, we will start with uh, an example that has something to do, of course, with the battlefield, but uh, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure you're all aware to this, uh, this story, and again, these are things I had the privilege of covering it this year, because of you, okay, thanks to your invitation, Rabbi Tender is like talking months, he's taking care of every small detail here uh, in this Shabbos, so while we talk, um, I was thinking, because I prepared this presentation, so again, because of you, thanks to, to, to your invitation, I went back to the archive, and I looked again at what I did during like 19, 2018, during last year, okay? So uh, I read so many examples of things I shared with the public in Israel, and I want to share some of these stories here tonight with you. That's the first example. Uh, do you recognize this young man? Hadar Goldin, of blessed memory. Hadar Goldin was a young soldier, uh, and he, he was killed during Operation uh, Tsuk Eitan, Protective Edge, uh, in Gaza, uh, three, and three, four years ago. Um, his body was kidnapped by Hamas, and wasn't, uh, I mean, Israel wants to get it back. There are two bodies there, two soldiers, two precious soldiers, Aron Shaul and Hadar Goldin. Now, the Goldin family, they're really like noble people, very special people, special couple, Professor Simcha Goldin uh, and his wife, Dr. Leah Goldin. And they both struggle in many ways. Of course, they came here to the UN and they're doing that diplomatic, political things, but they're also doing, um, I can say, spiritual, social thing in his memory. And I, I came a few times to the events that they're doing, for example, they're doing every year, Tikkun Lel Shavuot, 
before Shavuot, but not, you know, not on the Chag, before, one, two days before, they're taking Yitzhak Rabin Center in Tel Aviv, deliberately they're doing it there, in Yitzhak Rabin Center, and they're doing like a big event for like religious and secular people studying Torah together before Shavuot, uh, one of like Hadar's like messages or like it's something that really represents his spirit. And one year, I came here, I hosted the event one year, and one year I see Simcha, Professor Simcha, the, the father, like holding down a stack of like pages uh, uh, with remarks, like notes, and I asked him, what is it? I saw it's it is special, but I, I didn't understand what is it. And he showed me, he showed me this. What you see here is the book called Mesilat Yesharim, uh, the famous Musar book, uh, written by the Ramchal, hundreds of years ago. Hey, Mesilat Yesharim is like the, the path of the, of the righteous. You know what Mesilat Yesharim is. So Mesilat Yesharim, that's the book, the ancient text. But what you see here, written in, in a pen, in a pen in, with, a, with a pencil, it's Hadar, Hadar's notes, Hadar remarks to himself, personal things Hadar wrote while he was reading the book, because he didn't just read it, or as we say, the Sefer, Sipu. He didn't just read it, he wrote it here, okay, inside his heart. So while he was studying it, by the way, he took it with him when he was in Gaza Strip. It was here then, that's what worries him there. He writes all these personal things to himself about how to improve your personality and how to, uh, that's why it says, what the duty, what, what the person must do in his world, okay, when he comes to this to this world. And he's like writing things to himself, and Professor Baldwin found this treasure after Adar was killed. And he, of course, I told him that must be printed, okay. He said, of course, we're working on it. We're sitting with Rebanim, Tamir Tamim, we're sitting together, and that was the result. This book was published this year uh, in Israel. It is called Ech Not Chaim, How Can You Build Your Life? Chavuta, studying together, Bemesilat Yesharim, in Hadar Goli. Now his parents, uh, that became a bestseller in Israel. We hope they'll translate it into English because the, the thing is, you can still touch someone's spirit after he's gone. And that's, again, um, a, a really a revelation of, 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 of strength, not only in battlefield, okay? That's heroism when it comes to improving um, your own personality keep improving your uh, personality all the time, even in the battlefield. So that's like one example I think of, of things that are like happening in the cultural, spiritual field and it happened this year. And I, I want you to, do, uh, to know that, that, that we have, these are the, the, the soldiers, the warriors, and these, these kind of books are like printed and oh, Hashem, many, many people are buying it really impressed with what, what Adar wrote. When I look back at the year we had in Israel, there was also a, like a, big event, uh, maybe a, one of the largest event when it comes to counting the people, the amount of people that came. And that's, of course, the funeral of Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman of blessed memory, the past, sad, the sad passing of Aaron Leib Steinman became like a big headline. Now, I don't know, anyone was in the funeral in Israel now, right? <clears throat> Nobody from the US, even though they were very, very close and wanted to be there, wasn't there. Why? Because, again, it's a unique message, I think. What Rabbi Steinman taught us uh, in his uh, death, I think, was even uh, even like more impressive than what he taught his students, his pupils during his life. Because he taught something that millions of Israelis were like impressed. And I wanted to share what happened that day, okay, of his death. What happened is, first of all, Rabbi Steinman passed away at the, uh, at the age of 103, okay? 103. It means something when like you have a society with, with these are the superheroes, okay? They're not so handsome, yeah? they're, they're lovely, but they're not so young, okay? These are not like Hollywood celebrities, but these are, that's the superhero, that's the one of, uh, superman of, 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 of the like ultra-orthodox society, he was the spiritual leader of, 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 of this uh, stream. Now what happened that day, uh, he passed away, I think, eight, it was eight in the morning. So, um, 300,000 people attended, okay, tried to go, immediately to go to B'nai Brak. Uh, but when, when they arrived, just like us, okay, me, my husband, we took the kids in the middle of the day, we came to school, picked them up, we wanted them to be, you know, uh, in this event. 
but we were all on our way, huge traffic jams. People were like um, putting the car, okay, and started walking, walking for one, two hours, just walking because they all wanted to be there, okay? But nobody was really there. Now I want to, I want to explain. You can even say there was no funeral, okay? Because he wrote, as some of you know, he wrote in his will, no eulogies, no, not even one, not even the son, not even nobody, okay? I want you to bury me as fast as you can. And when uh, 300,000 people came to B'nai Rak, they all understood it's over, okay? They, 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 they were late. And what you saw in Bnei Brak Street, and it, when it was in Ramat Gan, it was in Tel Aviv, people were all over the place. What you saw is parents telling their kids a sipur, telling them about Rabbi Stegman because they will not hear anything, okay? Uh, there was no, like, no, um, no equipment even, because he wrote, I don't, want, I don't want that. So you saw many, many people just explaining to themselves, to their kids, to the people around them, talking about him, uh, because he didn't want us to do something like official. Now afterwards, uh, the media, the secular media, was very impressed to understand what's the secret here? What's going on here? So during the Shiva, two things happened. First of all, many pictures, that's his kitchen. That's the kitchen of someone who leads, like he, can, he could live in a different house completely. Okay, that was his kitchen. Again, this picture became very viral. And again, like, I think it, it, uh, there's a message here. That's how his simple, simple house look. But the main message was, 30 days later, and again it became a big headline. I want you to look at the text here. Now, I think all of your great-great-parents, they have also matzeva, right, tombstone, okay? N none of you wrote, okay, that's like, they all have like, um, more flattering texts there, okay? Think of, of, the, of the inscription, you see what's written here? It's like the simplest person in the shtetl passed away, only the date where he passed away, that's all. That's all you have to say, it's sad, it's crazy. But Rev, you can write here, Maran, Hagaon, Tzadik, Manhigador, number one, Rav, you can write everything here, and etc., etc. So what, you, what it says here, Hanusach al Pizzavato, yeah? The Nusach is by his will, the text is by his will, because that's what he wrote, nobody dared to do something else. But again, I remember the day when this came out, poof, and you look at that and you say, that's all, that's all. No, no, Reb, what's Reb? That's every Jew is like a Reb, what's Reb? And, <laughs> it's, and I think the message again, all these like, the family, they said we can't do anything else because we wrote it, you know, no doubt about it. But I think the message here is when you go up there, you leave all these titles away. You leave all these flattering words behind. And that's, that's the message I get from this. Everybody can think, each and every person can, can look at the tombstone, but I think, again, it became so viral that day. I don't know if Rabbi Shteyman even know what's viral, okay? <laughs> even knew what is viral. But it became, <laughs> it became so viral that day, again, because <clears throat> heroism means also teaching all of us, not only the Haredi students he had, teaching all of us, a lesson about, I think, about it's new, it's real, it's new, it's real, being simple and, and honest. And I think it means it means a lot. Uh, the, the, as the thing again, I covered it, I, I put it, I posted it uh, everywhere. Um, what also, as the year continued, something else happened. A uh, few people here talked, asked me during the, this weekend about like um, the diplomatic situation. Okay, Israel is like a, a situation among the nation. And different nations today. Um, I have a, um, a very easy way of, of seeing what's going on. We live in the, you know, the entrance to Jerusalem. Uh, I in one, you know, okay, Geshem the Supreme Court, Cinema City, yeah, what's the Supreme Court? We have Cinema City now, okay, that's the entrance. And we live there. There's a new neighborhood called Mishkenot Ha'uma. We're there for like five, six years, and the, we're the first. Uh, uh, people in our building, the new, new, uh, beautiful neighborhood. Now we see everything because that's the entrance to the city. So my kids, they have a hobby, okay, to see all the vehicles of the VIPs that are coming to Jerusalem. Okay, they just stand there like there's a balcony and they see the the, the, the road, the highway, the, the entrance to Jerusalem. And when they hear the first sound, you know, the so they go 
and uh, they see who he is and they see the flags because the Jerusalem municipality they hang flags every time someone's coming and they're like um, counting uh, the cars, okay, security cars and ambulance and all of these uh, um, vehicles, okay, the entourage, they're just counting the cars and they like to see who's like the longest uh, uh, like line, okay, and they write it and they have all these statistics, who's coming and when did he come and how many cars and so first of all, uh, Trump has the longest entourage, okay, don't be <laughs> surprised, of course, that's like, whoa, they didn't stop, but um, it's, it's very nice because they see, and I have my own statistic about Israel's uh, diplomatic um, uh, um, situation because I can tell that every two weeks, okay, more than once a month, a supreme, like a, a very important guest is coming to Jerusalem. Really, again, sometimes you don't hear about it, you don't see because Abu Mazen said something and the Hamas did something and the Hezbollah did something and you can't really, like, you don't see the statistics. It's fascinating to see during this year, okay, almost, I think, twice a month. Um, a very important guest is coming from all over the world. And I'm talking about, of course, Trump. Of course, uh, now John Bolton was, uh, was uh, our guest. Theresa May was there. Mac I'm not Macron, uh, Christian, uh, the Chancellor of, of uh, uh, Aus uh, Austria. Um, uh, we had, uh, uh, no, of course, Nikki Heidi was uh, the, the big uh, star when she came. Did you see her visit in the hotel? Did you see? That's crazy. She told the bodyguards to just let her go freely. They, they had this road, special road. They, did, they just, just closed part of the uh, woman's section for her in order that she will just go, you know, in a clean environment to the hotel. But when she came there, she told the bodyguard, I want to be like, like there. Regular people eat there. And she just went to a regular Zat Nashim, okay, with like, she was there with like soldiers, women soldiers, hugging all these Haredi girls, like uh, selfies, like hundreds of selfies were made that day. Really, that was very, very cool. When he nominated, when Trump chose her to this mission, I said, and she started talking at the UN, I said to myself, I never thought the Mashiach could be a woman. That's like, <laughs> that's crazy when she talks. That's, wow, she's something. Anyway, um, what my kids are doing is like counting all the Lithuania, the leader of Lithuania was, was in Israel. And of course, the leader of uh, this year, Netanyahu, by the way, also goes like almost every month to a very important visit out there, okay? He was in, uh, with uh, Modi, the leader of uh, India, and Modi also came, also came to Israel this year. And now he was in Brazil. Did you see the videos there in Brazil? And of course in Africa, and many, many places, okay, around the world. Plus they come, uh, they come to visit us. And it's not just, the, you know, it's not only the, a flattering thing, it's a positive development. It shows something about, you know, uh, uh, how they see us. And one of the guests, okay, he had short, my kids weren't so, and with no, no enthusiasm was the other way around. This and that, only like two, three vehicles, what's, what's going on here? Uh, that was like, ah, that picture, my kids took this picture. That day, they, uh, when the, uh, the, that day when they relocated uh, the embassy, they reopened the embassy in Jerusalem this year. Yeah, Jara and Ivanka, they all came, yeah, they all came. So this picture uh, was taken in, in Jerusalem from our house this year, but that's the guest. Uh, he's not a diplomatic leader. I explained my kids, it's just uh, he had these like two bodyguards and we saw him uh, entering Jerusalem, going to the Prime Minister's office and he also went to the Reuven Rivlin house, the president residence in Jerusalem. We saw him coming, but nobody was there with a shot, you know, surprised or really um, uh, even recognized him. But I think uh, his message this year, okay, all these leaders, their messages are important. When you listen to them, you can hear. They, uh, I, I would also, I can also say admire us. I will, I, I will not choose the word admire. They expect to hear something from us. They see us as a source of inspiration. Really, when I listen to their speeches, they all say, um, you're like a light among the nation, the Jewish journey, the Zionist mission. They expect us to be, I think, in a higher level, to tell something to the world, really. They, they, Modi said, Modi said, you are, I have like one billion citizens, you're so, such a small country, but I see a light here, I wanna learn from you. And they all, I think really, they tell us what we should be. But this guy, I think his message was the best message this year. His name, anyone recognizes him? Jack Ma. Okay, Jack Ma, yeah, thank you very much, Jack Ma. Jack Ma, 
is the richest person in Asia, okay? Um, in Asia, the richest person is not a Jew, okay? It's Asia, but uh, Jack Ma, Jack Ma is worth, um, I think I read that, and that's worth um, $35 billion, I think. You can Google it, I think something like that. And uh, he came uh, to Israel. He's the founder of Alibaba, okay? Do you know what it is? Yeah. So this guy came uh, to Israel this year, okay? We saw him coming, and I said to my kids, okay, um, uh, me say, that's another leadership, okay? Economical leaders, not a diplomatic person, but it's interesting, let's see what he says. And he spoke beautifully. First of all, he wanted to study Torah. He told, the, 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 with his delegation, he told um, uh, the people in Israel, I, I want to study Torah. So they brought Professor Shlomo Uman, you know who he is, is a Nobel Prize winner um, uh, from Israel, from Jerusalem, and a scholar, a Torah scholar, Tamil Chacham, Ramash, and they said to us, they were sitting together, studying, and he visited Israel and learned a lot about us, you know, Yad Vashem, Kotel, everything, and then, uh, he came to Tel Aviv University, he got an uh, honorary doctorate, Dr. Lashem Kavod, in Tel Aviv University, and then he gave a great speech, and he said something about us, again, about, about our heroism, okay, real heroism. He said, I've been here for a few days, and I'm really interested in your story for years, I'm following you, and I want to know your secret, I want to take it back to China with me, your secret, maybe it will make you richer, I don't know what, what does he want from us, but okay, he says, I understand the Jewish secret because I research, I research and I read about your history. I think for 2,000 years you were a homeless. Homeless. You had no home. Everywhere you went, it was only temporary. It was fragile. Like you are so vulnerable. You could, in one day, okay, the king, the queen, the leader, I don't know, the, could say, go, go out. And then you had to find another place. But that was also not your home. And again and again during your history, you you were you felt so you were kicked out. So you never had a place of your own. So you knew during these two thousand years that you can't invest in physical things because it's give their kid. Why are you giving it? Because all our parents are giving it. He said, wait a minute, there's something here. Nobody wants to do it, and we're all going to do it. No, that's not gonna happen. She called them up. She called the parallel grades, other parents from other classes. She called them with this assembly and said, maybe if we all agree, nobody will buy smartphone, even one smartphone will not be bought, and we will all buy together stupid, dumb, simple phones, like the old thing, we'll buy it to the kids all together. That will be the first phone, the simple one. We will all earn one year, maybe later, so that now it's already the second year of Tmimus, yeah? We have to go from Tmima here, you know what's Tmima. Tmimus, honesty, um, smart smart kids, okay? We want them to be more innocent, more more pure. We want them to be kids. So they all agreed, all of them. She went, she did like a big, like a deal with the, one of the companies because she said, I have 100 kids, okay? Give me 100 simple phones, okay? These kids are about to discover the coolest game ever, Snake. You remember Snake? <laughs> they are playing Snake. They love it. Now, what she did, I want to show you the, the video. What she did, okay. that's the logo. Okay, okay we see these two girls it. not playing, just texting without even watching, seeing each other. That's the logo of the new movie. <laughs> and then I want you to see, because she did like a, um, a, celebratory, a celebratory ceremony out of it. She did like a, that's what they had, very like, um, here, look at that day at school. <laughs> okay, so these, these kids are happy. Now, if there is no WhatsApp group, if there's no Instagram, so you're, you're not left out, okay? Nobody's out. They're all in with their snakes and messages, text messages, that's enough, okay? I don't know what's the right age, okay? I'm 37. I think I young, I'm young enough. I'm, I'm not mature enough to get such a, such a thing. So I really appreciate it because I think, again, the fact she's 
not true, not religious, okay? If I come and say, yeah, to people you say that, you know what's hadatha in Hebrew? It's an ugly new word in the news, hadatha. She's like, well, that, that's like making us know, she, eventually she wants us all to be satmar of the city, okay? And uh, she doesn't care about the phone, she wants us, uh, 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 smart parents to pay us to their kids, that's what she wants. So the fact that she's, I really help them a lot, I cover it all the time. We count the schools that are like um, joining. We have more than 100 elementary schools part of this thing, okay? Um, now we have, a, a week, um, this week, in the IBC, you know, in Antalya, the center in Antalya, we have like a special day to expose, okay? For exposure, we're bringing like hundreds of other parents and principals from other um, uh, um, schools to make them join next year, okay? There are cities like Masker and Batya, the city of Masker and Batya, all elementary schools, that's the mayor decision. All elementary schools are part of this problem. All the schools, elementary schools in Masker and Batya. Now we have to revolution, okay? It's, it's fun to be, to, to be a part of it, as a, again, as a journalist, she's the head of the thing. There are other mothers, uh, also of course religious mothers, joined and joined the, the thing, but um, I think in a world that is like becoming more and more, you know, crazy and extreme when it comes to technology, and these things are very important. Parents can still lead, okay? Kids are not running the thing. They're, they're not, uh, they, parents can, see, can still say no, and even in a, in a successful way. Because when I was a teenager, I remember there was this uh, philosophical question. When we wanted to, uh, 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 to be smart, uh, the people who think that we're smart, we asked the philosophical question, if a tree falls, you know, if a tree falls in a forest and there's no sound, was there really, and there's nobody there, was there really a sound, okay? Today, the philosophical question we should ask is, if two girls went to the mall, but did they, they didn't upload a photo, did they really go? Like I said, the best philosophers are thinking about it now. Did they really go to the mall? No photo, no evidence, no proof. Were you there? Are you sure? You did something without posting it? You weren't there. So um, basically, that's again another like a positive development in Israeli society. I think it can be a startup, you know. That's part of it. Israel can lead when it comes to, to this. Because I just heard the greatest explanation. You know who's Arab Yaakov Ariel, the chief rabbi of Ramat Gan? He said that during his whole life, he's reading Shema Israel, asking himself, how would one be so devoted? How would one, one really leave you know, by these values? And he said, that um, when he first saw his students with the smartphone, he understood everything, okay? Because when you look at the words of my side, look at that, okay? It's It's right? You bump into things all the time, and you Now, so much the, the devotion, you know, at the level of the devotion so high, it's Besho Becha. What's the last thing you do before you go to sleep? Besho Becha and Udku Becha, the winning you wake up. So we have devotion here, it's possible. It's possible to do it. Thank you. The question is, uh, the question is, uh, we prove that the human being can be so devoted uh, when he really, when he's really attached to something. The question is, what is your what, what what do you do with your devotion that could be with your love? Can you really do it when it comes to other values, okay? Other ideologies or you're just addicted to this thing. Anyway, okay. What we are about is Uber right? You bump into things all the time, but there are you and the other. Now so much the, the devotion, you know, at the level of the devotion so high, it's Besho Becha. What's the last thing you do before you go to sleep? Besho Becha and Udku Becha, the winning you wake up. So we have devotion here, it's possible, it's possible to do it. Thank you. The question is, uh, okay, the question is, uh, we prove that the human being can be so devoted uh, when he really, when he's really attached to something. The question is, what is your what, what what do you do with your devotion that could be with your love? Can you really do it when it comes to other values, okay? Other ideologies or you're just addicted to this thing. Anyway, okay. What we are about to see here, 
is uh, another thing I really, I see it as a, the Bible to Rebbe has said that the parasha is the headline. Okay, the real headline is that we are now reading Sefer uh, Shmuel uh, of Yitzhak Mitzvah. That's the real headline. Uh, the real headline, when Rosh Hashanah comes, that's the real headline. That the new Hebrew year starts, begins. Okay, so I really try to treat the Chagim as a headline, as something that's going on in the news. Okay, really, it's, it's really happening. So, uh, the Chagim, that's a great opportunity in Israel uh, to, to like bring it, you know, as into the news. Um, we have, I, I, you feel the Chagim in, in, in Israel, uh, as a Jewish state, you feel it everywhere, okay, commercials, ads, you feel it, you feel it in the end. But uh, I usually sort of seek for the like, special opportunities to combine like, the things that are going on, you know, on the news, and how, how does it relate to the Chagim? So what you see here, uh, one woman from the women's section in the Sterot Yeshiva, there's a Hester Yeshiva, Yeshiva Hester, in Sterot, in the city of Sterot, of course, the city in the in the south, you all know that it's like bombed and there are the, like missiles and uh, there's like a, for more than uh, a decade they're suffering since the evacuation plan terminated food from Gaza Strip and they're really suffering much, much more and they're really heroes. Talking about heroism, living there uh, and continue, you know, just taking the kids to school and working and having like normal life and not, in, not with not normal neighbors, okay? So um, uh, you have Alabama, right? We have uh, Palestinians. <laughs> so uh, no, 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 you didn't compare. Just a little No, no, I said it. Your neighbors are better. You can't choose your neighbors. I said my neighbors are really bad neighbors. And in the city of Zerat, they like um, try even during Yom Kippur, this was this this was like uh, uh, taken like two minutes after Yom Kippur ended, the fast ended. This uh, woman just uh, started the shooting. So during Yom Kippur, they tried to break through the fence. They tried to like uh, uh, hurt the fence, and I don't think they did it because they wanted to join Kol Nidrei. Okay, they wanted to do other things, and it's only like one kilometer away from from Gaza Strip. And what this woman said to me, that, uh, again, at the end of the fast, they weren't like eating, they were still like dancing and praying. And she said, look at the differences, okay? That's like the capital city of, of, of terror. And look at what we're doing uh, as an answer in the road, that's the spirit, okay? Inside. Now, 1,000 are coming 
where they, I don't know where they were all day. I don't know what they do. I don't know if they ate. I don't know what they did. Okay, I don't know. I don't care. I'm not asking. One thousand people. You see them here outside the shore are coming, and they want to hear the shofar. And she says, "I'm like, where were we? Hmm. We are not going at all back home. We want to hear the blowing of the shofar. The, 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 the um, that's the end of the of the holy day." No, they weren't there already. Nobody saw them. I don't know, again, what they did. But now what they are here, and listen to this, what happened is, what, nobody can get them. So what they do, that, 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 these are the, that, that them, you see them. The whole street is full of people. So every two brother, this girl is telling me, you see, they went out, blowing the shofar for these people, standing outside, okay, hearing the sound of the shofar. Now that's also, <coughs> the reality in Israel. I know it's not the main headline. I'm not saying we should open the news with such an item, with such an event. But we can't ignore the fact that many, most of the Israelis, they don't see their Judaism as a problem. Unfortunately, the media usually sees Judaism as a problem. We cover things only when there's a problem. We don't cover the things where the things that show that Judaism is a, is a, is a solution for many people. It's part of their culture. Okay? Although they don't define themselves as like observant, they observe some things and they, they want to hear the shofar before they continue their lives when the fast ended. And this small story is maybe even more important than the story of Sirot. And again, I had the sort of privilege of covering it. So I gave you six good examples, right? Positive things, I think, uh, 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 that are going on in Israel. But I promised a fadiha. Remember, you promised to a fadiha. Now those who weren't here this morning, <laughs> We can uh, inform you that a fatiha is a mistake. Um, it's also called a fashla in Hebrew. A fatiha is, can also be a fashla, okay? That's also slang. And a fatiha is something, uh, is a mistake you did. It's not a tragedy. It's a minor, tiny, embarrassing thing that happened. Now this year, again, as the year ended now, this journalist called me and she asked if I want to be a part of a survey she's doing. It will be published in the, like one of the internet, the internet sites, the biggest internet sites in, in Israel. And I said yes. And because, by the way, we're the only country, I think, in the world where we like uh, summarize, we conclude the year twice a year. <laughs> we do it on a nul. They have all these charts, all these, the politician of the year, the song of the year, the set of the year, the, the, and a nul. Three months later, again, what's your the man of the year? I just chose the man of the year. No, no, it's December. Okay, we'll do it again. So she, she's calling me. Asking me now, uh, 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 what's the fadiha of the year? She asked, uh, what is your professional fadiha this year? Which means, okay, when did you like mess up this year? But really, as a journalist, not in the personal things, uh, when you yell at your kids or yell at your husband, when it comes to journalism. And I told her, look, I have, I know what is the biggest fadiha I did, but it's a long story. And do you want to hear? She said yes. So I said, okay, no problem. I know what the fatiha here it is. Wait a minute, put this. No, no, not so far now. Here, there it is. That's the fatiha. Okay. What you see here is me with the cameraman standing here, a sound man standing here, and I'm interviewing a nice couple. You know who they are? There's Sharansky is, right. Nathan Sharansky and his uh, special wife, Avital Sharansky. That's their house, the garden, and that's the, the, like the backyard, and in Jerusalem. The story goes like this. I was asked uh, before Independence Day, the last Independence Day, 70 years of independence, uh, very exciting, so uh, I, I asked Sharansky um, to give me an exclusive interview. Now, it's not about him, he gives a lot of interview. I don't always agree with, with what he says, he has his new opinions as the head of the Sukhnut, sometimes I disagree. But I told him, you are not the story here. You gave me tons of millions of interviews since you were released from jail. I want to have an exclusive interview with your wife. Because Amital never spoke, okay? For 30 years, Amital never spoke about this heroic struggle of your, uh, um, Soviet Jewry. So I was like telling Nathan, I want to interview them together as a couple. He really wanted it to happen, but we had to convince Amital. It took a few days, okay, he was like a good cop, I was the bad cop, he tried to then, but she was convinced. The next day I was there in their home, interviewing them for the first time. This couple is retelling what they did together. 
Now, for those of you who don't know, I think um, the people like my age or even uh, older than me all remember the story, right? How many people here were like active or their parents were active in this like struggle? Okay, because then most Jews were felt like they were part of this struggle. One of the last, I think, uh, um, events that really made us united because of this person. Sharansky became the icon uh, of these million uh, uh, Jews around behind the Iron Curtain, okay? Uh, it was called the Yehadut uh, al-Mama, right? The silent uh, uh, jury, because they were there, communist regime. <coughs> he started the whole thing. Now, they're sitting, telling me for the first time again, the whole story. Fascinating conversation, three hours. And I'll just tell you like briefly a few of the things they shared. Shransky said, that he feels, uh, uh, he, as, as a kid, he only knew that Jew is, is a curse. For example, he, he said, I don't know what's Jew. I knew they were like a stupid, dumb, ugly Jew. He said, like, examples in Russia. Yeah, uh, 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 Jew. Like, it's a curse, it's something bad. But he, what does it mean? I don't know. At the, age of, at the age of 20, he discovered a book about Jewish history. It was illegal to even hold this book. Of course, it was illegal to read it, but he read it. Uh, and after reading it, he said, at first I thought, when I started reading I thought I'm 20 years old. Now I understand I was wrong. Now I understand I'm 3,000 years old. And he's like, began his activity in the movement, underground movement. Avital also had a fascinating story. She discovered she's Jewish, she's Jewish at the age of 15. Her older brother, Michael, told her the secret. Now they met, very romantic place for the first date, they met. Uh, both men in a demonstration against the KGB. Okay, very nice place to start their uh, relationship. That's where they went. Second date, they went to try to release Michael, the old brother, from uh, the KGB the, the police station. They were wandering, they were walking in Moscow, searching Michael in uh, police stations where the KGB people took him. That was second date, etc., etc. They decided to get married short uh, time later. They decided they want to get married. Uh, they found an old, old Jewish person that still remembers how do you get married as a Jew. They never saw a Jewish wedding. So the first Jewish wedding they saw was their own wedding. Okay. So get, they got married. He told them what to do and what to say. The ring, the cup, they did it all like robots. There was one sentence they did understand while they were getting married. And the sentence is, Im eshkachech Yerushalayim. Okay? If I forget Jerusalem, that, that they said we felt it, okay, we understood the meaning of it. The next day, the Kala Vital is going to Israel. She's making Aliyah. One day after the wedding. Why? Because she got the permission. She had the certificate, and Naman is telling you, go, run away, because you can't know what's going on. Go. If you have the permission, just run up to Israel. I will just take care of my documents, my papers here, and I will join you in a few days. Just wait. A few days, I'm with you in Israel. So she came here, as in, and she waited. She thought she would wait for like a few days. <coughs> Eventually, she waited for 12 years. 12 years. 12 years in Russia today. It turns out the KGB was already following him, okay, after him, that he was arrested. There was a trial, a fake trial, and then he was sent to jail. Many stories, what happened there and how he tried to remember what day is today, you know, when is Shabbat and when is Pesach, and how he, he, he she, like, he uh, fought in, uh, uh, in order to remain sane, and she was out there fighting for him. I mean, he was fighting for his, this, his sanity, she was fighting in order to release him, she did everything. Although she's very shy, as I said, she didn't want to even give this interview, she did everything. She went to the UN, she met Reagan, President Reagan, she met Mitterrand in France, she met Thatcher in Britain, she did everything, and she arranged demonstrations, huge demonstrations all over the world for him. So they both became an icon because of that romantic story, the chata, the kala, the groom, the bride, everything. And he tells me that every day, he had to convince himself he's not, he's not, he still remembers the truth. Because what they did, I think millions of, millions of investigations, trying to break, to break him. And he said that one of the things he did, she gave him a small Tehillim book. Before he went, went, uh, went to jail, she gave him a small Tehillim book. Now he was reading it constantly, again, again, and again. 
his Hebrew wasn't so good, but he, he studied math and logic before he, 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 he became a prisoner. He was a student, so he studied math and logic. So he remembered how do you like um, use the, the, context, the context of the word. This appears here and here and again. He, he said he had these tools to understand gam, im, rak, ve, as. He had these simple words in Hebrew, and he tried to understand like the meaning of sentences. And then one sentence, the first sentence he read in Hebrew, like jumped in front of his eyes, and for the first time he understood what he said. He didn't just read it, he understood the meaning. And this sentence was, they tell me, during, while I'm interviewing him, he says, this sentence was, Gam ki elech, the gates are rapid, lo ira la, ki ata imadi. Even if I go out in the shadow of death, I will fear no harm because you are with me. He said, all the letters Abital sent me, the KGB took them. But this letter, they wouldn't say, that was a message she sent to me. She is with me. Lo yarak, Yataimadi, Abital is with me. Hashem is with me. Yataimadi, Am Israel is with me. The people of Israel out there, they're with me, demonstrating for me. And he said, I also felt David Amalek is with me, King David. He wrote these words. He at time he wrote them for me here now. He's telling this story. I'm like, wow. The sound man is like, wow. We're all so excited. And the cameraman goes, oh, that's a nice sentence. What is it? <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you can sit in Russian jail telling you the, 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 the verses from Tehillim, but you can sometimes live in Israel without knowing that uh, the sentence he was really, he said, it's a beautiful sentence. Right? Again, <laughs> okay. anyway, um, as you understand, I want to elaborate the really fascinating three hours. So where's the panicha? What do you want? Put it in the list of the positive things you did, and the heroism, that's, that's heroism. There is a panicha. And the panicha is something I did. I asked him, the last question was, why are you giving this interview? Why are you giving this interview? What, what's the reason you suddenly uh, agreed? And then, Sharansky said, he answered. But he has like this strong, Accent, awful accent in Hebrew. Yeah, you know, maybe in English it's better, I don't know. In Hebrew it's hard to understand. But in English it's also, uh, I, yeah, they still try to understand what he said 12 years ago. I understand he was there. They told me, because he was here, uh, very like, uh, he saw a play uh, that goes on to did uh, many years ago. Anyway, it's hard to understand. And he gave a long answer, a profound long answer. And this answer, when I edited everything, that was out. It was never published, it was, it was never screened, it was never shown to the public. Because I chose to tell the heroic stories of Tehili, Mechatuna, and First Day, the KGB, and I said this question, this answer, that I have to choose, I have to make three hours into eight minutes. Of course it's out. That's the Padikha. Because the answer we gave, I think, is the deepest answer you can give today when it comes to Jewish heritage, Jewish education, the best answer ever. And that's the best message. I keep thinking about it since Independence Day. Since I interviewed them, I'm walking with this answer here in my head, hearing it. But unfortunately, I'm the only one hearing it because nobody saw it on Israel TV. So I want to share this answer with you. Maybe we will try to fix it, to correct, to erase my fadiha, okay? To unfadiha what I did. <laughs> we will unfadiha what I did because really this answer is great. And what Sharansky said is, why are we giving this interview? I'll tell you why. I think every Jew today that is watching this interview <coughs> is braver than me. And I'm like, how can we be braver than you? <laughs> Anyone here ever sat uh, one night, spent one night in Russian jail? Anyone? One KGB investigation, one. One hunger strike in order to get back your tefillin because you want your tefillin. So he didn't eat for, I don't know, many days. Anyone ever? No. So how can we be braver than you? That's not, that's insane. And he explained, he said this, when I was in jail, everything was very, very easy, very, very simple. I, I don't mean simple physically, that was hard. But mentally, spiritually, the greatest things I had. Everything was very clear. I knew right from wrong. I knew that's like white and black, that's good, that's bad. It was so obvious. The distinction between no problem. Everything that is good was identified with me. With it, Zionism, Ezra, Torah, Ivrit, Mitzvot, Aliyah, everything. Tehillim, Filin, everything. Chappas, everything that is good, it's me. Everything, that, everything that's bad, 
It's them, communism, violence, complete devil, evil, but of course. The minute they walked out, everything became confusing. The world out there is very confusing. I walked out and I saw everything is allowed, everything is open, everything is accessible. Democratic, liberal world, pluralistic world, you can do whatever you want. Choose. Nobody's telling you, don't put a fill in. Nobody's hiding, no, shh. I don't want to tell you if it's Shabbos today. I don't want to tell you what day is today. I know what day is today. What do you do on Shabbos now? You, you can do anything. You can keep Shabbos or not. You can do half. You can, one day you can be Jew, one day you can be uh, Muslim. You can mix everything. You can marry whatever you want. Nobody forces you to do anything. Now, for years, he said, we're forced. Somebody's been chasing us. He said, look, look back. Nobody's chasing us now. All our like ancestors, when they look this way, they saw someone, they saw Hitler, they saw Stalin, they saw Lenin, Paro, now we're reading about Paro. They also, I don't know, the Nebuchadnezzar, the, 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 we have uh, um, uh, Haman, Shverosh, all the mean guys, okay? So, now I'm looking back and nobody's there, he said. Nobody's chasing me. So we don't have this, uh, to have this mysterious selfish, we have this devotion, we will do it because of tribe. we are hiding and we're doing, we're lighting the candle, there's so many like, story, heroic stories. But real heroism today is not sitting and telling what they did during the Holocaust. It's what, what are we doing now? Nobody's, nobody's telling you anything. Now, what is your decision? Nobody's telling you you're not allowed to do this and this. You're allowed to do everything. What do you want to do? That's the hardest question we're asked today as Jews in America, in Israel, everywhere I think in the open world. And he's telling me, every Jew that is watching me is interested in my story, is interested in Jewish history, Judaism, in my heritage, so I think he's braver than me. Because if today everything is accessible, you can do everything, you can be everywhere, anytime, if today you're interested in your identity, you are braver than me. And I was like, wow. First of all, you're right. You're right. It's, I, I wasn't in Rast Jail, but it, I understand the concept. It's hard. But the Fadiqa is that the most important message I got from him about our Jewish commitment wasn't on. <laughs> so today, there's a lot of writing here too. <laughs> today we're like picking it, we're taking it from the uh, floor of the editing room, okay, picking it up <laughs> and sharing it here. And I really tried since then, walking everywhere in Hebrew, in English, I don't know any other languages, but sharing it with people. Because I really think um, if you are here tonight, you're real heroes. He says it. He said that your the person that was uh, for 12 years in Russian jail is telling that your brain were here. When you come to Beth Jacob, when you go to activities, when you come to Israel and support Israel, every mitzvah you're doing, every chesed, tzedakah, I know you do a lot here. Every good thing you do. I just heard what you did during the storm one month ago. Is it a month and a half? You, you were a part of it? A year and a half. A year and a half. A year and a half, right. When you don't experience things, you don't really, you know, don't really feel the day. A year and a half. People are telling you, wow, this, I understand there's another world record that was broken here. 700 people, eight here. Wow. Okay. And everybody is telling me, we hosted like 10 people, 11 people, uh, we brought the challah, we brought the, you don't know what the key douche we had. And there was a couple that wanted to get married here, there was a priest, there was a bar mitzvah, there was a family with birds and snakes. I don't know, I don't know what happened here. But you know, <laughs> that's heroism, that's also heroism. When you do, when you, are proud of your Judaism, and you want to develop, and you want to share it with others, that's a cure place. You share it with others, you're doing things outside of your private world, that's heroism. And I think his message, this Fadiha, taught me that maybe that's the most important message ever, and I really wanted to share it uh, with you. I shared many uh, popular uh, viral things. I wish us all uh, to learn from these messages, but I recently wish us all to see together the most viral video will also be the most final video of the final redemption of the Islamic Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're more than welcome to follow anywhere, Twitter, WhatsApp, Instagram, whatever. Thank you very much because many of you asked, okay, so I don't, I don't know when I'm going to go here again, come here again, but you're more than welcome to follow.